Hi everyone, I'm Marky from Alibaba Cloud. Uh, today, I will give some introduction for the cloud, uh, for the Docker adoption in China, and uh, I will introduce the container service on Alibaba Cloud and what we have done on top of the Docker native uh, clustering. Okay, okay. Uh, Docker is the hottest technology in the world, it's the same in China. And uh, we do some online survey uh, in this April, and uh, we got the feedback from 1,400 respondents. And uh, in the survey result, uh, about 80, 83% of users are already using Docker or plan to use Docker in the next six months. And, uh, okay, okay. And uh, currently, uh, about 23 percentage user are using Docker in their production environment or dev tabs in China. Okay, uh, in our survey, the the largest internet company are the pioneer for the Docker adoption. Uh, for example, uh, using our our company, the Alibaba Group, uh, with the rapid uh, business growth for the uh, e-commerce platform. We are facing great challenges on the scalability, agility, and the operation cost. And um, we try to solve this, this problem with container technologies. Uh, uh, that means since last year, we started to dockerize all our core business application. And uh, with that, we success successfully support our Double Eleven shopping festival. How many people do you hear about the W11 shopping festival? Okay, pretty, pretty much. Okay, uh, in, that, in the last year and uh, in the peak time, the transaction number for the uh, e-commerce e website is over 175,000 per second transaction. Underneath is powered by Docker. And now we have more than 300,000 containers running around the world. So I believe we are the largest the Docker deployment uh, in production environment. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, why we choose Docker? Because Docker can help us to easily to scale out our workload to the cloud and help us to improve the hardware resource utilization and uh, minimize the operation cost to manage such a large-scale distributed environment. And uh, in the last October, uh, we announced a partnership with Docker. That means we'll have work with Docker team to bring the Docker Hub services into China to help millions of developers. And uh, we are working together to accelerate the Docker enterprise edition adoption in China enterprise market. So. For people who doesn't know well for the Alibaba Cloud, let me add more few words. And uh, Alibaba Cloud is the cloud division for the Alibaba Group. Uh, we are the largest uh, cloud service provider uh, in China, and we are also a leading global uh, players. And uh, we already have 14 regions around the world. And uh, we provide the infrastructure services like the compute, storage, network, database, and we also provide the big data and security services. And we also have the container services. Okay, we, we launched the container services since uh, December of 2015. And uh, okay, so we provide the container service on top of the both public cloud and private cloud, and we can enable the hybrid cloud scenarios. And uh, in the container layer, that means besides the Docker engine, we provide the uh, volume plugin and network plugin to integrate the storage and network capability from Alibaba Cloud. And in the class, managing, uh, class management, uh, service management and scheduling layer, we're fully compatible to the Docker native cluster, and we do a lot of extension on that. Uh, we support like we support GPU resource scheduling. We support the batch 
uh, cron jobs. We support all scaling, such kind of things. We will talk something detailed uh, in the later slides. And uh, it's a full managed service. That means the people doesn't need to care about container infrastructure. They just focus on their application. So. Uh, in the last years, uh, we have hundreds of customers by working with them. We are very happy to work with them. Many of them are uh, internet companies for the e-commerce, O2Os, and uh, social media. And some of them are very large traditional enterprise, uh, like TIC Group and uh, Shanghai Stock Exchange. And uh, they are very large financial uh, co companies. And we are also working with some uh, some emerging industry customers for AI, for IoT, and for life science. Uh, it's very interesting to work with them to understand their scenarios. So. And uh, let me go through some technical details. Uh, no more uh, business size. And uh, uh, firstly, we're fully compatible to the Docker native clustering. That means we support both Docker Swarm and Swarm mode on top a set of virtual machine or physical servers. And each cluster is dedicated to one user. And the developer can describe their application uh, with Dark Compose, which consists in a set of uh, container services. Uh, the beauty for the compatible to the Docker native clustering, that means the customer can do the dev test on their laptop and, and run the the production deployment on the cloud without any code change. Furthermore, we're following the principle for the infrastructure as services. That means we can assemble the cloud resources and the containers together in a declarative way. So we can do everything in the Docker Compose. Uh, let me use a very simple case. For example, I want to set up a simple website I uh, want to use the uh, Nginx as our web server. But web content actually is stored in the bucket of object storage. We can use the, we can use the volume plugins to mount the bucket as a global volume to the, cluster, to the node of the cluster so that uh, the Nginx can easily to get the content from that. And I try to expose the NGX endpoints and make it, oops, make it bend to a load balancer in interf uh, instance. We provide an extensive label that you can describe that. We can easily to bend this container support to the load balancer. So, and the orchestration layer will do the do, to, to do the, such kind of bending, so you don't need to do anything. It's fully automated. And we can, to achieve the high availability, we hope the Nginx web server can be spread, spread around the different availability zones. We can leverage the latest Docker engine feature to do some placement preference that to spread the containers by the labels of the node. So with that, we can easily to do a very high level website. So, and uh, auto scaling. Auto scaling is a very, very popular feature required by customers. Uh, that's what we have done with Docker Swarm. So basically, uh, we deploy the monitoring agent as a global services installed on every node of cluster. And the monitoring metrics were gathering the uh, the monitor agent will get the metrics from the container and uh, send it to the cloud server, uh, to the monitoring server for aggregation and processing. The scaling triggers, oops. The scaling triggers actually is declarative as part of the service label. So I can say, if the C every CPU is over 70%, it will scale out two containers. We can do such kind of thing in that way. And, uh, and after that, it will use the webhook to notify the uh, cluster master and to, to scale out the new containers. And uh, with the load balancer, it can easily to offload the workload. Okay. We, and we support both the 
cloud monitoring services on Alibaba Cloud, and we also support some open source uh, monitoring solution like InfluxDB plus Capacitor. And our monitor agent is also uh, play well with other monitoring solutions. So, uh, in the Swarm mode, I think uh, one of the popular features is about the rolling update. But uh, besides that, we hope to get better control for the application delivery. So we provide the blue-green update on the Docker Swarm. So uh, let me use this case, for example. Uh, I have one application, actually have two services, one for the app and another for the DB. Initially, the version is the blue version and such kind of deployment here. And I have some update on the application part. So I provide a new definition with the green version. And uh, it's a new template, Docker Compose template. We can apply such kind of Docker Compose template into the Docker cluster. After that, the, both the green version and the green, uh, green version are running at the same time. And the user can adjust the width for the different version. So they can control how many traffic will move to the new version. Uh, after test, they can decide to roll out the, the update or roll back. So with this approach, the customers can very easily to release their software safer and faster. And a lot of customers are using this approach to, for their software release on the cloud. Okay. Motion learning. Okay, motion learning is very popular technology in the past years. And it's getting more and more popular to using Docker to, to deploy such kind of distributed machine learning uh, applications. And we do some enhancement with the GPU uh, resource scheduling. And uh, currently, it's still our own implementation. And I, I, we saw the NVIDIA team submit some, some PR for the, uh, to the Swan mode. Hopefully, we can have more general way to do that. Okay. Uh, in our approach, actually, the firstly, we support the virtual machine and the, or the physical machine with GPU acceleration in Alibaba Cloud, as known as the EGS or HPC. Uh, and uh, our agent actually has awareness for how many uh, GPU devices are available from the cluster nodes. And it will send the information to the manager of the cluster to, for the scheduling. And for the application developer, they can do that very easily. They can specify how many GPU devices will be used with very simple label, like alu.gpu equal to. That means two GPU devices will mount it to this application. And um, with that, we can easily to, to deploy such kind of application workload requires the GPU acceleration. And furthermore, we we are doing something so-called solution template for different kind of workload. Uh, let's use the machine learning solution as an example. You know, uh, for the typical case, uh, the developer want to use uh, the machine learning in different way. Some is for dev test, and something is for, tra uh, for training, and the other is for serving. So uh, for example, if a customer selects a solution template with the distributed training. What happened? It will show a, a form to let the customer to easily to fill some parameter there, like select which framework, like TensorFlow, which version, something like that, and how many parameter servers, how many workers will be used, and how many GPU will be allocated for the worker nodes, something like that. Uh, and uh, when they click deploy, actually a Docker Compose file will be generated underneath. And uh, the, the data analytics doesn't need to understand all the detail for the Docker, but they can get a fully runnable machine learning solution in a few minutes. And, and it will also encapsulate some best practices for using the machine learning technology on the cloud. Uh, for example, it will mm, synchronize the checkpoint file automatically to the object storage. So you, if, if the application is failed, it can easily to recover, something like that. Okay. Uh, 
so far, more and more uh, cloud services on Alibaba Cloud actually are powered by the container technologies, like uh, Elastic Web Hosting, the internet middleware, and uh, our serverless offering so-called function compute and machine learning solutions. Uh, beside that, one interesting thing is uh, the private offering of Alibaba Cloud, uh, so-called the Absara stack, actually all the controller nodes is running inside the container. That means, uh, uh, just to be clear, uh, the virtualization layer like hypervisor is still run on bare metal, but all the controllers for the virtualized the computing, storage, and network actually are running container. With this approach, we can, use, we can only use one-fifth our resources to deploy such kind of full-blown uh, uh, private cloud in the customer data center, and it only requires two engineers to set up five, 500 server uh, private cloud in two days. So it's pretty amazing. That's done. OK, thank you. OK, do we still? Yeah, do, do you have any questions or just run out of time? OK, OK. If you have any questions. OK. Uh, if one, you want to see some demo, want better understanding, please go to our booth right in the G11. Okay, see you soon. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, real quick show of hands, how many of you would kind of self-describe yourselves as developers or application owners? About half the room or so almost. Wow, okay. Uh, operators? Okay. NetApp competitors? Really? <laughs> Come on, let's be honest, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm a technical director at NetApp, my name's Garrett Mueller. Um, I've been at NetApp for about 13 years now, actually more than 13 years. I started off as a, an ONTAP kernel developer. ONTAP is uh, one of our primary storage platforms. Um, I did that for a long time, and about three years ago or so, I kind of picked my head up, looked around, and decided there's more out there than being in the middle of a storage stack, and uh, this space seemed ripe for, you know, for, for storage and for opportunities, the kind of opportunities we were looking for from a storage perspective for a long time. Uh, so we started a, a small kind of grassroots effort within NetApp back when nobody even knew what Docker was, really. Uh, saw a lot of potential there. Uh, built up a, a pretty sizable team, and now, uh, as, as a thank you for that, I'm responsible for everything open now at NetApp. So you get what you, you ask for, I guess. Um, I'm gonna go through this agenda uh, fairly quickly. I only have 20 minutes to go through it, so um, I am gonna start a little bit about talking about NetApp itself. Uh, it was, it's, it's, I guess, somewhat surprising to me always that uh, people hadn't heard of NetApp before or you know, the primary storage companies that are out there. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an introduction, but I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. Then I'm gonna go through and talk a little bit about why this complexity problem is so important for us to solve, right? The, the, the storage complexity problem that a lot of our, our customers and partners and the ecosystem in general is faced with. Uh, a little bit about what we have today and what we're going to be doing in the future through industry partners and uh, industry relationships that we have with other companies and uh, organizations like Docker themselves. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and show a, a short demo of some of the cool stuff that we could potentially do uh, as a community. So um, I'm not going to go through all these details, but this kind of gives you a recent kind of snapshot, no pun intended, I guess, of the kinds of innovations that NetApp has been leading the charge on for a long time. We're 25 years old this year. So uh, it's our 25th anniversary. Uh, we started by inventing snapshots really early on. I mean, that was our first year. Um, we had the first NAS appliance in 93. So we've been doing this, obviously, for a while. Now, over, over time, we've uh, you know, taken on more capabilities. We have we had uh, the first kind of NAS and SAN together appliance. Um, we've done a lot of other stuff along the way. And now we are a portfolio company, which means we have a lot of other storage platforms other than our, you know, our initial one. And we have a lot of other use cases we can enable outside of some of the, the initial stuff that we did. Um, now, when, when, when that happens, what you end up with is a picture that looks a lot like this, right? 
Now, from a developer's perspective, right, anybody who's not a storage administrator or a, somebody who's building infrastructure, this looks completely insane, right? Um, now, there's a lot of great capability and value that's hooked into this, in, into this picture. Um, we have, a, and a lot of unique stuff as well. Um, so obviously we cover, you know, file, block, and object. We have platforms and single platforms in some cases that can do all of those things. Um, and, we, and these platforms, like uh, one example is we can have one platform that sits on premises uh, in the bottom there as, you know, big iron, kind of the traditional storage platform you would think of. But that same platform can exist in a colo right next to a cloud or more than one cloud actually, right? And we can communicate between these different storage platforms and provide up unique value, right? The, value, the ability to migrate data around, the ability to have uh, backup and data uh, DR use cases that are either in the cloud or next to the cloud and give you access to all the compute and burst capabilities of the cloud, for example, but still own all your storage. There's also service providers that will run that for you. So you can have that portion of your you know, ecosystem managed for you and you're, you have your on-premises stuff. Uh, and there are people that just do it completely end to end. Now we also have the same platform can run directly in the cloud too, right? So we've got in the cloud, we've got next to the cloud, we've got you know, on-premises and we can hook all of that together across multiple platforms. We can do things like have your primary data in a volume on premises that then is tiered from fla uh, you know, flash storage to a hybrid storage inside the same controllers all the way out then to S3, right? We can tier it all the way out there. So there's a lot of different ways this can get all interconnected. And with all, those, all, those, all that flexibility and with all of that capability comes you know, potentially some complexity, right? Or quite a bit of complexity. Now the traditional route for managing all this would be hook into all the different, you know, traditional orchestrators of things like this, like your VMwares and, and you know, your vSphere's and things like that. Uh, try, try to get you know, a single pane of glass, maybe even a NetApp provided one, right, that handled only the NetApp pieces of this, and uh, try to stitch it all together yourself, and then surface up hardly any of the value to the developers that could actually take advantage of this. I don't think we want to go that route anymore, right? I think this is just too much for you to be able to manage or for anybody to be able to understand and derive value out of, but there's a lot of cool stuff you can do, right? So what we're trying to do is we call this the data fabric at NetApp. And this is the ability to stitch all of our platforms together, not just to have them in a single pane of glass so you can see them and they look pretty, but in order to actually have them work together to provide value, right? So, but what we want to do is take that to the next level, which is, give you the value and capability that, you know, the promise of this without having to understand it, right? Without having to understand how it's all pieced together, without having to understand what any of these words mean, right? And still get the value that, that we're trying to derive out of the whole system. So all of that without any, any friction as well. So um, this looked a lot better on mine, I promise. <laughs> um, so I thought this was supposed to be like you create it on your laptop and you run. Uh, something like that. Anyway, haven't done it for PowerPoint yet. <laughs> um, so the, the, the Docker volume plugin, we released this uh, over uh, a year, a year and a half ago at this point almost. Um, this is a, uh, our primary Docker integration. What it basically does is it provides the Docker volume level API integration with all of our primary storage platforms. So it works for what we call our E-series, our Solidifier, and our ONTAP primary storage platforms. It connects to them directly. Now, that's interesting and cool, and uh, we can do the, the, the classic things like allow you to provision your own volumes, uh, and uh, you, we even allow you to run multiple instances of the same plugin with different names. So you can imagine having things like storage classes defined, right? So that you have a gold storage class which has this particular configuration, you have a silver one that's this configuration, and when you're a Docker user, using this infrastructure, that's, that name might be all they know, right? So they go ahead and say that, I want a Docker volume of gold. You as an operator know what gold means, but they as a u end user have, there's some definition that you've given them for gold, which is maybe it's really fast. Maybe it's uh, backed up really well. You know, maybe it has other properties that, that make it interesting for your end users. Um, so we allow those kinds of use cases. We also allow you to, uh, through the platform itself, meet a lot of the compliance and regulation requirements that you are naturally going to have as you move forward, right? So for us, it's a lot of, uh, how can we most simply integrate with the platform so that you as an operator can provide the kind of value 
to your users that you, know, you would get out of any kind of cloud deployment, but at the same time, have the kind of you know, uh, control that you need, the minimal levels of control that you need to put you know, everything in the, right, in the right slots so that people are running where you want them to be running, right? And they're, and they're, they're actually uh, keeping data where you want it to be, right? Rather than it going all over the place and you're not sure where it is or, or what people are doing with it. So, um, but in order for us to do that, we have to der derive ways for you to provide those kinds of, to, to give you those kinds of controls without adding friction for the end users. Because as soon as you do that, as soon as you're in a place where somebody wants to provision something and they can't do it themselves anymore, we're starting to lose the value, the, the, the instant, instant gratification that comes with all this uh, and the cloud-like behavior that people are expecting. So, it's important for us to maintain, maintain that. Now, this plugin itself is, is it's written in Go. Uh, it is on our uh, uh, GitHub site. It has, the, so the source is there. It's also on Docker Store. So if you went to Docker Store today and searched for NetApp or NDVP, you would find the plugin there. Uh, it means it's, and by being on, by virtue of it being on the store, what that means is that it's supported. It is, has been security tested. It is go, has gone through a qualification process, and Docker's aware of it. And you know, there's a relationship there, wherein if you have issues, you can reach out to either of us, and we'll get that taken care of for you. So, uh, definitely look out for Docker certified, especially if you're running these things in production. Um, there's no cost for it. It's just a, it's a free plugin, uh, so it, you know, it works with all those platforms I mentioned before. Uh, one other unique, uh, somewhat unique thing that we do is we, we enabled, even though the Docker volume interface itself today doesn't allow you to um, do these sorts of things, we were able to extend it in such a way that you can, for example, do a Docker volume inspect on a volume and list the snapshots that are associated with that volume. And uh, using some, uh, some options that we bake into the way Docker volume create works, you can even create clones off of those volumes or the snapshots associated with those volumes to get instant copies. So from a developer's perspective, this is just a really fast way to take an existing volume and get a really fast copy of it, right? Uh, for us and how that's managed on the back end, you don't care, right? All, it, all you know is I said I want a volume that from this, one, this volume and now this volume is called this new thing and it was really large but it instantly showed up and I can actually operate and manage it independently, right? So. Those kinds of use cases end, end up really interesting. I'm gonna go through a, a few use cases uh, in a second here. So, um, so the potential right here, so obviously you can run stateful services in containers. Uh, we support all the classic things. In fact, if you look at Docker Hub, what's interesting is uh, people have talked about this for a long time. You know, well, what about state and containers? I think we're well past that now. And if you look at the list of images that are most frequently downloaded, most of them require state or are managing state of some sort of their databases or their, you know, there could even be web servers that have static HTML pages. They could be Redis and things like that too, right? So there's, uh, there's plenty of images out there that require this. Um, now, I, I mentioned the cloning and snapshot support stuff. This is really important for things like this, where in, in a DevOps workflow, if you're doing some kind of, uh, you know, like a CI CD environment, you want to give people the ability to ha get their workspaces really quickly, instantly, possibly with pre-built binaries, right, based on whatever you're building. Um, and suddenly they're, they're off to the races. We actually use this internally at NetApp uh, in order to do development on our own platforms. Uh, instant copies of your production data is another important use case. So people don't think about this very often. Often you try to create a synthetic version of your, of your workload or your, or your database or whatever, and you try to make it account for the, the, the myriad different things that you see in the production environment. But in our case, what you can do is you can just take a cloned copy of that production data and use that as part of your test suite, right? So that you don't have to actually have a synthetic version of your, your data at all, you know, other than like, you know, smaller unit test style stuff. Um, now, for the future, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I wanna to get to the, the, this other part. Um, we anticipate uh, being able to be able to manipulate volumes after you've created them. Right now, after you create a volume, you can see it there, uh, but you can't do things like you know, change the size. And our platforms allow you to, to do that on the fly, and I think a lot of other platforms allow you to do that too, so I think it's an important use case. Uh, you know, renaming things and, and whatnot too, just kind of the obvious stuff that you expect to be able to do after you provision something. Um, and of course, snapshot support, which we've, we've done, we've kind of worked around the system to allow it. Uh, we very much prefer that everybody could play and it was normalized so that everybody else could uh, you know, participate as well. Um, 
other things here, I'm not going to go ahead and go into all these details, but these are the kinds of things we would like to uh, be investigating as next steps, because I think there are a lot of use cases, both for kind of classical second platform lift and shift style applications, as well as third platform applications that, you know, are, are becoming all the rage these days that uh, we could, we can assist with those workloads in lots of different ways, uh, but we actually need the orchestrators and the platforms to come together and help build the models for how that's done. Now, there, that, that brings me to my next slide, which is, um, what are we doing at the community, but also what is the community doing? So we have uh, a lot of different working groups right now. Uh, there's the Kubernetes storage working group. There is the CNCF now storage working group that just spun up recently. Uh, there's this CSI initiative, which is called uh, it was a container storage interface, which uh, the four kind of major orchestrators came together to try to figure out how do I build a model around all this, and that's very recent, like over the past few weeks. So there's a lot of interest in this space in, in kind of building a model for how this all works, and we're participating in all these different areas in order to help, help that unfold. Obviously, we have a, a lot at stake in how that happens, but we also have a lot of different platforms that we're trying to enable, so unlike most companies, we actually have to do it in lots of different ways ourselves. We're not just focused on a single platform and enabling a single use, use case or a single platform. So uh, we have that problem in spades. Um, obviously, we're, we're already building integrations. We have the NDVP, which I already mentioned. We also have an integration for Kubernetes, which is called Trident. Works with both Kubernetes and OpenShift. It's a dynamic provisioner, so it allows you to you know, dynamically provision storage uh, against all those same platforms I mentioned earlier. Um, we're, of course, experimenting with new models and um, doing upstream development as well, and we expect to be doing a whole lot more of this. Now, we're, you know, we, we've gotten past kind of the initial hump now, and people are actually using this stuff even in production. We need to get to a place now where the model is expanding enough that more and more people can use it, and we can unlock more capabilities without also adding friction. So it's important for us to do, go ahead and do that work upstream. Now. Um, I want to show you guys a, 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 a demo, actually, which is this thing that my team worked on. Hopefully, this will come back. All right. So we have at NetApp these uh, these hackathons, these these things where basically you know teams will get together and they'll, they'll work on work on something cool and then report out about it. And what my team decided to do is, I mean, over a, a, a few days. End to end, what we did is we actually built snapshot support into Docker itself. So it wasn't just putting it into the plugin, you know, working around the system, but in fact, work, you know, actually writing code in Docker, in Docker Engine, writing code inside of the uh, Go volume plugin helpers, for those of you that use those, uh, as well as plumbing it all the way through to our plugin. And I think you'll see here, this is an example of the way that this could be done, and in fact, a way we're, we're, we're going to be encouraging uh, very soon now. So uh, you can see here that there's, this is the regular Docker volume command output that you would normally see. Excuse me. Um, and what, what we've added here is we have this snapshot set of management commands. So what we did is we tried to make this as natural as possible. This is an evolution of the Docker uh, volume interface. It shouldn't look like something that came from a single company. It shouldn't look like something that is abnormal for those of us that uh, would be using this sort of thing. Uh, also, uh, my team is in the OpenStack community as well, uh, you know, as an open source community. So we have a lot of history here in how to do this in a way that is kind of natural for, for and people that are trying to think of infrastructure as an agnostic thing. So let me go ahead and move this forward. All right, now this is a Docker volume snapshot commands. And uh, so you can see there's a create, there's an inspect, an ls, a rename, a restore, and a remove. The mo most of those are, are self-explanatory. The only one that probably might not be is restore. So create obviously allows you to create snapshots at a point in time like you would expect. Restore is to allow you to t choose one of those snapshots and completely uh, replace what is currently on that volume with that restored copy, which is interesting for kind of backup and restore use cases, especially if you, you know, are working on something and you screw something up and you want to just go right back, right? So this is an example of us creating a regular Docker volume. This is using NDVP. And you can see the Docker volume LS is showing NDVP1. Now we do a snapshot LS of NDVP1, and there are none because it's a brand new volume, so there's no snapshots, right? 
Now we go ahead and create a snapshot. The snapshot has a timestamp and a name, right? You gave it the name. And then there's, a, there's an inspect command, and the inspect shows the list of snapshots. If there was more than one, then you would see more than one here, which you will in a minute as we do that. So you can see the timestamp here is very important, right? Because it's a, it's a point in time copy of what's in there. And of course, different platforms do this different ways. In our case, you know, uh, we actually have two different storage platforms that do it in slightly different ways. But it's a very efficient operation for, for our platforms. It doesn't cost you any additional space. Uh, they're, they're basically instantaneous. So uh, they're relatively free from, a, you know, from an infrastructure perspective. But the, the value to developers is huge, right? So here's a cloning from an existing volume to another vol uh, from an existing volume and an existing name snapshot to another volume. Now here's a restore. Now what's interesting is some platforms have restrictions like this and other ones don't. One of our platforms requires you to kind of, rest if you're gonna do a restore, it actually prevents you from restoring to the, any snapshot but the most recent one. So that, because you're actually deleting data when you do that if you think about it, right? You're actually, you're, you're gonna lose one of your snapshots if you move past that. So you can roll back and iterate through them if you want to, but this is just an example of we did prime it end-to-end, -end, and we even have errors you know, showing up through the process, so intentionally. <laughs> so here's an example of we just went ahead, went ahead and uh, went back to the, the very last snapshot, restored it, and there you go. So then you have your regular Docker volumes here listed. We went and re renamed one of the snapshots here. because that timestamp name is kind of crazy. <laughs> and you can remove them, and you can remove the snapshots, you can remove the volumes, and get back to where you started. And that's basically it. So hopefully that felt pretty natural. If you were used to using the Docker volume command set, that's what you kind of would have expected with snapshots. We would love to hear feedback from you guys about what you would like to see there. Uh, any changes you'd like to, see us make to how that, you know, how that unfolded or any, you know, anything that kind of was a, you know, a surprise to how that worked. Um, whether you're you know, working on a storage platform of your own or expect to use functionality like this. Um, this is the kind of stuff that we're gonna be doing upstream in the community, you know, increasingly going forward in the, in, on the Docker side and you know, through other container iterations as well, container orchestrators too. Um, and that's pretty much all I had. I hope that was interesting for you. If you have uh, any questions, you can come see us at our booth, uh, G24, which is on the floor down there. Also, if you want to reach out to us, we actually have a uh, kind of practitioner-focused website called netapp.io that we encourage you to go to. It has all of our blogging and uh, you know, everything social media related to what we're doing here. Also, if you go there, and there's a link to a Slack team there, uh, my entire team and uh, several other teams at NetApp are out there on Slack uh, all the time. There's a containers channel if you want to have if you have any questions or you want to get into more details, we can talk about it there. Thanks.